So welcome to uh, another web session. This one for the content covered last week being thinking systemically. Um, for today, I'd, I'd like to first do a little bit of miscellaneous updates and then talk about the, the content that was for review last week. And then I'll do a Q&A on anything from day one to today. Um, there are a number of areas which had become apparent. They're uh, sort of uh, things that numerous people are, are sort of tripping over, and it'd probably be good to go over some of them again. In terms of the miscellaneous updates, you probably saw my note in in the um, the news update last Sunday, and I intend to, to send them out every Sunday to sort of ping you to say that there's content that you're supposed to be working on just as a as an annoying reminder to tell you what's happening and what's changing in the environment. But there was a note in there that where I said that things have sort of calmed down in the environment and so that people could focus on the content as opposed to all the changes that kept happening in the environment itself. And the, the Kumu developers saw that and they weren't having any of that. So they made some changes to Kumu, which warranted some updates. So I'd like to tell you about a couple of them that that you should notice is immediately when you go into the content. What they did was, well, previously you you selected an item and then you had to go down here and do a manual focus to bring that particular segment of content into into focus. They've now fixed it so that it's it's a one step operation. You're not you don't have to go do a manual focus anymore, and you also um, if you click here and go back and say that you want systems thinking, that's the segment that you get now. And everything has been pinned. This, this entire set of content is sitting in one place and it won't wander anymore. Some people were commenting about, about getting dizzy watching the things sort of drift across the screen. And every time they opened it, it looked different because everything is now pinned, everything stays in the same place. It just, though, it will move a little bit because I'm sort of tweaking the environment as to where where the stuff is actually residing. Um, just sort of, you know, trying to evenly space stuff so it's not it's not too much of a mess. Though, when you look at some of the items that are lengthy, such as the the Insight Maker one, it just happens to be rather long, so you, you're going to have to to pan it around and use the mouse wheel to, to mouse in and look at it, and then you know sort of work your way through it until you get to the end. Um, and yeah, I mean it's it's rather straightforward. You should get comfortable with it in you know two or three minutes. So that's that's the first update. The second update is. Um, Nobody has been overly fascinated with the LinkedIn subgroup to begin with. It takes too long to get there, and and the environment is sort of annoying. And so what the what the developers have actually done is um, they have implemented a discussion threads option in Kumu itself, and this is just the help file for Kumu where we've been playing with the discussions so that when you're in this particular set of content for the, the certification program, all of these links are going to change and they're going to point to a discussion that's actually inside of Kumu. I'll, I'll put a link on here someplace that goes to the discussion subgroup so that if somebody wants to go there and look at all of the content that's been posted, None of that's going to go away. It's just would be more convenient for everyone if you you just stay in the same environment. So what it will look like is that, that these links will take you to the discussion for the thread the way they do now, only they will actually be in inside of Kumu so that I will implement the the 
12 threads for the different segments as discussions inside of Kumu. And when I implement the discussion, everyone will get a note that it's been initiated, though you need to do a post to it to actually start following it. I'm going to ask them if they can do something so that you can say you want to follow it without actually having to do a post. And they said in a, in a couple of weeks they'll implement an option so that that you can actually unsubscribe for from a thread. I expect that at some point in time you, you simply have have seen enough of the program operations thread and you don't want to see any more of the posts there so you should be able to go and say I don't want to follow this one anymore. and they said that that feature will be there in a couple of weeks so so at in the short term we're just going to end up with a series of oh, and you can go ahead and just get back to all of them by clicking here so that there'll be a list of them you can come here and I think they're going to do a thing so that you can get to the last item to, to leave an, a comment quickly because the, the lists get kind of long after a while. Um, and we've been, we've been tinkering around with them and there are some things about them which make them, um, where's, let me see, we go to this one. I think it was here or somewhere else. Um, discussions. Uh, you can, if you have a a graphic that's someplace on the on the web, you can actually get a graphic to be embedded in the discussion, which I think is a nice improvement. The and the link capability works in a couple of different ways, and and I'll provide information on that, but. It's just, um, that means that when a person, oh, don't look, at this is way too much. When a person actually participates in this program, all they need is a Kumu username. They don't need to, to go connect with me and subscribe to this group and get into the subgroup. Everything just remains right in Kumu, and I, I think it will be helpful. And if it's not, I'm sure that you'll let me know. So those are the two things that one has already happened, and this one is coming, and I will make sure that I talk about both of them in the newsletter that will come out on Sunday. Okay. So the content for today, uh, any questions before I move forward? Okay. The, the content or the segment for today is thinking systemically. And I hope that that you have developed a sense from the time that that the program started in Web of Wonder and went through systems thinking to Insight Maker and thinking systemically, that the idea was rather than to present a, a lot of theory, to to sort of let you develop an awareness of systems thinking and the benefit of doing models and simulation through experience by exposing you to, to various and sundry models and allowing you to to see the the implications of the interactions in the models so that from the from the bird feeder dilemma the the implications of of not thinking past the initial thought of what you wanted to do and all because of all of the implications that were there that you would have to live with once you undertook the initial action to the idea that from rich pictures and causal loop diagrams which are static pictures there is a sense of the relationships and the implications that you can get a sense of, but only to a certain degree. The initial fox and the wolves and the and the uh, maintaining the forest simulation models were intended to provide a sense that that in certain instances you're really only going to get a 
a sound understanding of the implications of the interactions if you get them to unfold over time so that you can see how they play out. You can look at the picture and you can get a sense of the fact that there are relationships there, though the real implication of those relationships is something that evolves over time, and it's just very difficult for us to intuit what the implication is that develops over time. It's been said that, that it's, it's pretty much beyond our mental capacity to intuit the implications of two or more simultaneous feedback loops and, and how that's going to play out. Personally, I think it's um, one feedback loop with a delay involved someplace. Um, it's just real difficult. Until you play with them for a while and you get a sense of them, and then as soon as you think you understand what's going to happen, you build the model and it does something unexpected and you get an opportunity to learn something else. So the idea was to, to begin simple and evolve what you were exposed to so that they were more and more involved, more elaborate models to the content for last week in the thinking systemically attempting to present a set of models which were more more realistic they were situations that that one could relate to to see the real implications or to get a sense of the implications at least from a from a qualitative perspective. Now the other thing is there, there have been a, a number of people who are doing very well creating simulation models in InsightMaker. And they're, they're, they're pushing the envelope in terms of what, what they were given to operate with because the idea was in the Insight Maker segment to provide an awareness of rich pictures and causal loop diagrams and, and just an introduction to simulations, though there's only enough information there about developing simulation models to be dangerous. The, the, the entire program is not expected, or you're not expected out of this program to come away being a, a simulation, a capable simulation modeler because the content isn't provided to support you doing that. Now, some people seem to be doing amazingly well based upon what they weren't given to work with, though for those of you who are struggling with it, don't let it get you down because it's understood that we didn't give you much to work with it was intended to be an exposure to develop an appreciation for that dimension. In, in July and August, I'm doing a, uh, I'm developing a eight or nine segment modeling and simulation with InsightMaker program similar to this that actually gets into to all that's associated with 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 developing a better understanding of how to do simulations, better understanding all the ins and outs of Insight Maker. So I wanted to to cover this so that you got a sense that if you're if you're feeling uncomfortable, don't let it bother you because there's there's if, if you finish this program and are comfortable developing rich pictures and causal loop diagrams, then, then you're, you have progressed to the extent that was intended for this program. Questions? Okay. Are there, are there any particular 
Any questions about any of the specific models that were covered for this week? Okay. There is one that has been an immense source, apparent source of confusion on the part of multiple people. And it's the one about business and its customers. The intent is that, that all right, let me do this. Or the, the understanding is that if I create two variables and I draw a link between them, and I say that that is actually a, a positive influence. The intent is to understand the plus to be an overloaded definition, to say that, that this variable adds to this variable, or this variable changes in the same direction as this variable. So it's and, and which meaning is appropriate depends upon the context. If this is inventory and if, if this is production, inventory is, is a, a, an accumulation of something that has been produced. So production creates inventory as production as there is production it adds to inventory if production goes up it adds to inventory even faster if production goes down it still adds to inventory just not so fast and if production goes away completely the inventory is still there all other things held constant the the Sometimes people think about this from the perspective that, oh, well, we have sales. Yeah, well, how about sales? And sales has an influence on inventory, but it has a negative influence on inventory. So that as sales increases, it decreases inventory. And if sales goes up, it decreases inventory even faster. And if sales goes down, it still de decreases inventory, but not quite so fast. So that when they're trying to think about this relationship, they can't stop thinking about this relationship. So that they, they it causes a confusion in terms of trying to interpret the plus relationship. The idea is that you think about the relationship between two entities with everything else held constant. And then you look at the influence of other things, and then once you've identified all of the different influences, then the question is, what happens as a result of all of these influences happening at the same time? So that it could be, if I... Let me go put this back. If, if production goes down, inventory could go down if sales is, is greater than what the production amount was because it's sales is taking it out of inventory faster than production is putting it in there. But if you simply think about one relationship to identify what that relationship is, you have to think about that without respect to any of the other possible relationships until you get the model built, and then you think about them all together. So this situation occurs when you're talking about things with regard to stocks. This, I drew this as a variable, but it's, it's really 
it's really a stock. Though in typical notation for rich pictures and causal loop diagrams, the stocks are not identified. They just look like any other variable. It might be, just be the label inventory. So that there's a confusion that results because of the ambiguity in the diagram itself. That's why stock and flow diagrams are convey more information than a causal loop diagram because of the explicit nature of them and the idea that there's absolutely no way to move anything in or out of inventory except with a flow, not just a, a variable relationship. So, and the flows have to be made explicit. So the reason that I prefer the plus and minus notation, even though at times it ends up being difficult to, to sort out, is because it has a tendency to force you to sort it out and, and not be ambiguous, because if I label this as S and this as O, then the S and the O only have one definition. It says that this changes in the same direction as this, which means that as production goes up, inventory goes up, and as production goes down, inventory goes down. And it's just not true. So I deal with, with the difficult nature of the plus and the minus notation because it forces me to think about whether or not I'm dealing with um, variables or whether I'm de dealing with stocks. And, and how do I interpret that relationship? Though it ends up being confusing and to the point where I actually confused myself when I presented this diagram in the in the last step of it, trying to explain the relationships that I had sorted out and then I had lost the sense of it being sorted out so that that the business enjoying success takes action which promotes its own success, and in so doing, it subtracts from the value that it creates, value which added to customer satisfaction, so that, that customer satisfaction is not a stock. If value goes away, there's no customer satisfaction left. So that, that the plus sign means, in this instance, that customer sat changes in the same direction that value does because it's not a stock. So as the value declines, customer satisfaction declines, which causes the demand for this other product other from another supplier to increase, which causes the demand from the business to decrease, and that decrease then results in the business not being as successful and hopefully causes them to to get back and pay attention to to what they ought to be doing so that you end up here with with a stabilizing loop uh, as opposed to a, a reinforcing loop. And it's a stabilizing loop because when you walk the loop, you, you have one, two, three balancing influences. And if the number of balancing influences in the loop is odd, it's a balancing loop. If it's zero or even, it's a reinforcing loop. Now, oftentimes, I, because the, the interacting loops are difficult to see, this, this one's not difficult, and this one's not difficult, and this one is also not difficult to see that it goes from here around to here and, and back up to here. So that, that's B3. But it does get to a point where it's, difficult to see them all together, which is why I made the rest of them 
invisible so that you could just see this loop, which is the stabilizing loop. Trying to explain the stabilizing loop in the, in the midst of looking at all of the loops together becomes quite difficult. So the, I continue to find that, that it's easier, often, most of the time, it is easier to convey the meaning of a diagram to people if you can unfold it for them as opposed to hitting them with all of it at one time. I like to eat an elephant one bite at a time. So, and the, and the comment about um, that the model itself represents a story so that if you look at this, the, the loops are sequenced. So the first one is a reinforcing loop. The second one is a reinforcing loop. The third one is a balancing loop. But I sequence them accordingly so that it's R1, R2, B3, B4, R5, and B6 so that I know the sequence that I should pay attention to the sets of interactions so that it tells an appropriate story. Simply labeling all of the loops as balancing and reinforcing without sequencing them, one doesn't have a sense of, of how the story is supposed to unfold. And, and it makes it very difficult to understand the, the model. The, the model itself, the model is a pattern. Though, as a, as a whole pattern, looking at it all at once, it ends up to be confusing because of all of the interactions. Though if you unfold it piece by piece and it tells a story, the story is very easy to remember, or much easier to remember than just, just looking at all of the pieces and trying to figure out what it means. Um, Sean asked the question about, can inventory be bidirectional, having inventory increase sales? If so, and how, okay. In the, in, the, in the model that I was doing over here before, I showed sales as a inverse relationship to inventory. So that as sales increased, inventory decreased, and as sales decreased, inventory, uh, see, I did it to myself again. As sales increases, inventory decreases. As sales decreases, inventory still decreases, not, just not so fast. Sean's question about inventory having an impact on sales itself, which can actually be the case in a lot of instances, because depending upon what it is that customers are buying, sometimes they're, they're very fickle in terms of delivery times. I mean, you know, I ordered it and I want it. I just paid for it. I want it now. And if you're going to tell me that I've got to wait two weeks for it, I'm apt to see if I can go find someplace I can get it tomorrow. So that that if your delivery, whatever it is that you're carrying in inventory, and you don't want to carry any more than you have to, I understand that, to be able to, to satisfy the demand then it can be that, that the inventory itself can have an impact on sales so that if inventory goes down, sales goes down. And as inventory goes up, sales goes up. It depends upon what it is that you're inventorying. If you can figure out how to, to instantaneously produce things, then you don't need to carry any inventory. You can build everything to order and, and ship it five minutes later. But that, that's a little difficult for a lot of things. Does that cover it, Sean? So are there any questions about about the the wonders of of well, let's see. Michael has a question.
Michael asks, if a link is a plus and refers to a flow into a stock, can the flow go negative, or does it require an outflow to reduce the stock? You can have buy flows. When, when, you, create, when you create a stock and flow diagram, All right, let me reverse this. You can well, tell it that that you can have negative flows so that it then actually puts an arrow on both ends of it so that there are rela I mean this I, I don't know what there could be another stock over here or you just you, you don't know where it, in this particular instance, you don't know where it's coming from and you don't care, but it can flow in, in both directions so that, that depending upon what's governing the flow, with that relationship, it could cause the stock to increase, and as this changes, it could cause the stock to decrease. The, looking at a flow that terminates nowhere simply means in the context of this model, I don't care. When you fill the bathtub, you typically don't care or don't think about where the water comes from. You turn on the faucet and you fill the bathtub. If you are responsible for filling all of the bathtubs for everybody that lives in town, you're probably concerned about where the water comes from. Depend, it's, the, it's the context of the model that helps you understand what's relevant for that model. So, so if I'm responsible for the town's water supply, it's very important to me where the water is coming from. Okay, Michael. Um, let's see. What else? Could Mike says, I see a problem explaining the R5 depressing loop to someone with no ST training. Most people, because the red minuses are not intuitive to a lay person. Mike, if I, if I had to describe this model to someone who, with no familiarity with systems thinking whatsoever, I would probably not put the pluses and minuses or the, the red and the blue loops on them because then they want me to explain it. I would simply draw the lines all the same color and explain what's happening in that loop and, and not make them think about what the relationships are. Though for me to get to a point where I can explain it to them, I need to do my homework, which means I need to understand what's happening with the relationships, and then I can explain it to someone else and not confuse them with detail that, that they're not interested in, don't care about, and would simply be confused by anyway. The, the, the ongoing question is, how do I sell systems thinking to my organization? The answer is you can't, so don't try. But what you can help others do is better understand the implications of relationships, but you don't have to you don't have to beat them over the head with how you understand that unless they ask. It's it's my the comment that I I don't know I I tell this so often I don't know maybe it's redundant but trying to tell people what I did in terms of defining systems thinking and and they just never wanted to hear it they just wanted me to stop and. They couldn't figure out why they asked me to begin with. And and when I finally positioned it to say, we, we 
try to figure out how to solve problems so they stay solved and not create new ones in the process, they, they could relate to it. They could connect with it because they had experienced the situation where the situation arose and they fixed the problem. And next week they fixed the problem and next week they fixed the problem and next week they fixed the problem again because they ended up treating the symptoms as opposed to the un underlying source of the situation itself is like playing whack-a-mole, you know, every, just, every, for every one you pound down, another one pops up. And you can play whack-a-mole forever, or you can figure out how to cut the bottom out so none of them come back up anymore. Okay, Mike? That the understanding the audience that you're trying to communicate with is is crucial um, and um, so you in other words causal loop diagrams were actually an outgrowth of some some work done in the system dynamics community they had developed a, a, a stock and flow simulation model and they wanted to present their findings to to some people, and they believed that if they tried to present the simulation model itself, it would simply turn off the audience. So they figured out how to do some relationship diagrams that would communicate the findings in a way that was was understandable by the audience. And, and if the audience then wants to know more, you, you can offer more, though you should never offer enough so that it pushes them away. And it's sort of a delicate balancing act, why, which is why I continue to find that it is, Jeff tells me that everyone's, everyone's models are ugly except their own, which is why the best way to have someone understand a model is to have them build it. So there are times when I will go do my homework and I will build this model uh, or some other model, and then I'll throw it away. And then I'll sit down with someone and we'll start, we'll just start talking about relationships and talking about, okay, so the business is creating value for its customers, which results in demand, which and the business grows. And and don't have to use all of the pluses and, and just you know, just a sense of what the influence is accomplishing. And then asking about, well, what happens when the business begins to promote its own success? It succeeds. And then the question is, okay. So if the effort it has to expend effort to do this. I mean, you can't get something for nothing. So if this is happening, what other impact does this have? And it, it's sort of, you know, shepherding an awareness. Um, I know, it's still subtle manipulation. I got this, let's not go there. Um, helping to develop an awareness or an understanding. Though what I also often find in doing that is I've spent all this time developing this model that I now understand. You know, and I just I just want to give it to them because it's the answer, okay? Which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. When you sit down with a, several other people and you begin to build this the model that you have you have spent so much time with and, and you are so proud of that in the process of developing the model they ask all these questions that you never thought of and you have to be agile enough to learn from their perspectives so that you end up with a model that's better than the one that you brought to the party to begin with and and when that happens it's just it's marvelous because everybody ends up learning. Yes, Judy, it's 
I, I believe we should not confuse the notation that we use to help ourselves understand with what it takes for others to understand. <laughs> Judy said, no, it's not subtle manipulation. It's a really important lesson in how we share this learning with others, and it seems to be one of the hardest parts. Great idea to build the model with them. It's, I, I ended up being at a conference in Seattle last month, I think. And I was I was asked to do a four-hour workshop, and I hadn't done a workshop in ten years, and and it was it was at breakfast. Well, it was somewhere in the plane flight between Chicago and Seattle that that it finally dawned on me that it it was a workshop and not a four-hour presentation. And and then I then I realized that I hadn't done a workshop in ten years, and so at breakfast I sort of reconfigured the whole thing, and it was. It actually turned out amazing because the, the participants had no experience developing models. And the first model that we had them develop was this one. This is, this is, this is amazing. Tom, Jerry. Okay, <laughs> and and after they did this, I said, if if anyone feels now that you have performed an unnatural act, if anyone feels ill, you can leave now. <laughs> we had and and the the thing just got more out of control from there, and it was just four hours of absolute wonder, because at the end of four hours, these people. We're creating stuff better than this from from never having created a model before and starting with Tom and Jerry. And I just it was awesome. And and they did it. You know, it's, what, what is the the quote? When the sage has finished his work, they will say, "We did it ourselves." And and it's it's about what they accomplish. Amazing! It's it's just so so rewarding to see people excel and feel good about what they're doing. I mean, if we just started out with a lot of theory explaining to them how you had to do things, it would have put them off from the beginning. So so I would say that it's it's a way to to work with people within your organization to help them develop a better understanding of those things that interrelate, which have an implication for the things that you are doing or the way things are at the moment. And it's helping people develop that understanding. You call it anything you want to, I don't care. You don't, don't have to call it systems thing. I mean, the the, the comment about for 70 years now, systems thinkers have been attempting to sell systems thinking to the world, and the world isn't buying because the world doesn't want to be sold. Uh, systems thinkers to, for the last seven decades have been the greatest impediment to the broader adoption of systems thinking because <laughs> the the roofers roof leaks and the cobbler's children have no shoes and you know it's it's more of the same systems thinkers can't think their way out of their own problem oh and i'm part of the problem so uh, covey said true proactivity begins when we realize the extent to which we are part of the problem sorry i get carried away was a mike says Mike said, um, struggling 
mightily with creating a model of inner conflict has forced me to question a major assumption I have depended on for years. Oh, such a good struggle. <laughs> okay. And Judy comments, yes, any time I have talked about systems thinking more conceptually, I see people's eyes glaze over present company accepted. Okay. So, it's, it's uh, what? Uh, Rupan wants me to explain this diagram one more time. Let's see if, <laughs> see if I can provide the, the same description that I gave last time. Let me let me sort of dispense with the details and simply talk about the fact that that business business develops and succeeds based upon the extent that it creates values for its customers and they are satisfied such that they they create more bus more demand for the business itself and healthy businesses grow based upon growing their customer base and customer satisfaction though the way that businesses often lead themselves astray is that they find ways that they believe that they can promote their own success that has nothing to do with customers. It's sort of they forget what it was that made them successful to begin with, which was creating value for customers. So they decide to manipulate all this stuff that, that improves the health of the business, at least in the short term. So what happens is that it takes effort to do that, and the effort to do it ends up detracting from the value that's being created to produce customer satisfaction. So that that decrease in customer satisfaction results in a decrease in demand, which which has an impact on the success of the business. So it so it ends up. The, the business's attempt to promote its own success ends up limiting its own success. It's its own worst enemy. And customers, being what they are, finding that they are not nearly as satisfied with this business as they used to be, go looking someplace else so that their decline in customer satisfaction increases demand for some, maybe a lower price supplier or a greater valued supplier or something, and that supplier is creating value, which is replacing the customer satisfaction that the customers lost because this business was no longer providing it. And that reduction in demand ends up impacting this demand, further having an, an impact on the business itself. So what's happening is there's a there's a underlying stabilizing loop in the midst of all of that so that the business focusing on its own success ends up diminishing the value that it's creating and producing customer sat so that the customer sat declines which increases the demand for the other supplier which decreases the demand for the business itself which has an impact that demand results in less business for the business itself and it ends up balancing out because the the business begins to realize what it's doing to itself so it begins to to be less its own worst enemy hopefully sometimes they don't realize it till it's too late People people ask about how did this company go out of business slowly for a long time and then all at once. Well, it's good to remember that the the calmest place in the stream is usually right before the falls. Let's see. 
Rupam asks, that means left-hand business ignored customer value thus worked in isolation. Yes. It, the business, it sort of, it gets addicted to success, and, and it knows the effort that it takes to create value for the customer. And it looks for other ways to promote its own success. You know, it's it's far easier to in, to invest its money in money to make money off of money as opposed to invest in new product development, which would grow its customer base. And and often, you know, and well, we can sort of shortchange all of our brick and mortar and machinery in terms of maintenance, and it improves the bottom line. But sooner or later, it's going to, you know, it's going to come back to bite you in terms of, of not take care, taking care of all of the maintenance on your equipment, and you end up having to spend more money to replace it later, or it just doesn't work as well as it used to, and the, what it produces is not as good as it used to be. And so there's a there's a number of different ways that that they can focus on promoting their own self success. And seldom do they ever figure find a way to promote their own self success without having an impact on the value that they they create for the customer. Let me see this this one's kinda of long. Let me read this. Uh Michael says, I'm still finding it hard getting started on a new model. Okay. Michael, I used to, starting a new model used to be unbelievably painful. The worst thing I could imagine was a blank sheet of paper. And because I, I was so fanatical about wanting to get it right, I had to start in the right place. And as it turns out, there is no right place. There's no wrong place. Think Nike. Just do it. This this diagram, which has six loops in it, I've probably drawn a dozen times. And even after the last time I drew it, somebody commented that I labeled one of the loops wrong. And I had. It, you, you start whatever it is that you're thinking about, and you follow the relationships, because the pieces are connected, it doesn't mar matter if I start here or here or here or over here. Once I begin to, to get it developed, then I begin to get a sense of, oh, here's this, the order in which the story makes sense. And then I begin to go back and start, okay, let me start here and build out from this point because it makes more sense to unfold the story this way. But I didn't know that to begin with. I said, well, I know that the business is creating value for its customers and it's trying to do this and, and demand is an issue and, and I know that there are competitors. And so I, I just put the pieces down and, and start, start doing connections. And I can't get it right the first time. I probably can't get it right the first three or four times. So it's not trial and error, it's trial and learning. It, there are certain things that you can think about endlessly. Yeah, okay. You can read books about riding a bicycle forever, but the only way that you can learn to ride a bicycle is on the bicycle. Swimming is more fun in the water. Um, Nike, just do it. So I hope that helps. Uh, <laughs> Jim, just Jim says, "Oh, that's where I am now." Jim, are you in the water? No, uh, sorry. Um, Judy asks about so we could have another loop of R and D or one of improving customer satisfaction to get sales back. Judy, this is this is a perspective. This is not in no way complete because it's it, it's a trumped up situation. When we develop models based upon real situations, it is the situation that we're trying to figure out 
what, how to deal with that helps me understand what relations are relevant to the model I'm trying to develop. It's why I continue to say, and, and lots of the stuff I read says, don't model systems. Start with a situation you want to understand how to deal with and model that because that will help you understand what to include and what not to include. Because, and to the comment that I make about what Russell Ackoff said, so it doesn't matter where the problem appears, the, where you have to deal with the problem is usually somewhere else. So that, that you know, if you've talked well, the comment that we were talking about before in terms of uh, production and inventory and sales and, and inventory having an effect on sales. So sales are down. Well, is it because the sales force isn't doing their job? Or is it because uh, the people doing purchasing haven't been able to find a supplier that can deliver the stuff on time so that production is off, so inventory is off, so customers are waiting four times as long as they used to for product, and they found somebody else to buy from. Though it showed up because sales is off. And and it's sales is not the problem. The problem is someplace else. So you have to. I mean, you know, one of the examples that you're going to look at, called the accounts receivable period reduction, which which was evolved from a story I found in a book, has to do with a a, a company whose average accounts receivable period is much longer than than they consider acceptable. And they told the accounts receivable par department to fix it or else. And the accounts receivable department worked on it intently for a period of time and couldn't fix it. So management fired them all and, and hired a new group of people and said, fix this problem. Well, as you, as you go through this model and it unfolds, you'll find out that the problem is absolutely someplace else, not expected. That's, and the accounts receivable people cannot possibly fix this problem, but they're the ones that are getting fired for it. So, sorry, I get carried away. Uh, let's see, let me see. What do you recommend to cope with uncertainty in the model? Can you do stochastic modeling similar to Monte Carlo? You, you can develop the simulation models, and even though they're, they're not discrete, you can put um, random number generators in them to, to get a sense of, of the implications of the variations, and you can do um, there, there are functions in Insight Maker for doing sensitivity testing to say, if I vary this piece by this much, what impact does it have on another part of the model? Or you can do optimization and goal seeking to try and figure out what are the, the best values for certain things. Though there, those are outside of the, the, the realm of, of what I think is reasonable to attempt to tackle in, in the extent of, of this program. Though, though they're, they're in Insight Maker and there are videos about them in the Insight Maker user's guide, which there's a link for this in the Insight Maker segment. This is also in Kumo. It's just like the one that you're going through, only this one's still floating. All of these blue ones are functions so that for every conceivable function in Insight Maker, there's a video that explains how how it works and, and how to work with it. So that there's, there's here's one on, oh, charts and tables. Well, that's good. I just made myself a note to do one of these. I forgot I did this. 
So um, find and replace and shortcuts and, and storytelling and button scripts and, and it's just so it's um, it's a very deep product in terms of what it's capable of doing though as I said you don't have to learn it all at once you sort of take it little by little by little and and the next model is a little bit more complex than the last one and the next one you figure out how to do one more um, feature that you didn't do previously and and you'll get there okay I felt I feel like I talked a lot today, uh, and oh, and we're out of time. So, are there any other questions? I hope you found this session informative. I'm amazed. It. So, okay. So I'll uh, I'll go ahead and put out the newsletter on Sunday, and talk about the stuff that you should be. Thinking about next week, which is the enabling a better tomorrow. This the segment next week is about a single model. It just gets presented in a lot of pieces. Though it's all about beginning with a situation and and going through all of these steps at looking at different aspects to figure out how to develop a strategy for dealing with that situation. So it's probably it's probably the most coherent of the segments to this point where there were lots of different models in the segments leading up to the one for 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 what wait a minute this is Oh, this is enabling a better tomorrow is what you're supposed to be looking at this week that I'm going to do webinars on next week. Sorry, I get mixed up by the schedule itself. So hopefully you are finding the content um, more, more coherent or more or the different pieces more interrelated than you have found in the previous segments. And if you're if you're not on schedule, don't feel bad about that either because. Um, it, the schedule was ridiculous to start with. And I'll see you next week. So thank you much. Bye, all.